Hi, welcome to the Sankofa Pan African series. Have you downloaded your free copy of our children's illustrated biography of African legends yet? Please do so if you haven't. Don't forget that we owe our children a responsibility to expose them to our history. Also, please help us to continue bringing you videos like this one by supporting us through Patreon or Buy Me Coffee. Please, please also subscribe, share, and like our videos. Hugh Burnett, civil rights activist. Hugh Burnett was born on a farm outside Dresden in Ontario, Canada on the 14th of July, 1918. His parents were Robert and Myrtle. Both were descended from enslaved African Americans who had escaped to Canada in the mid-1800s. Dresden was one of the several endpoints of the Underground Railroad in southern Ontario. Now, a significant Though it, it, a significant black community had been established in and around Dresden as refugees from enslavement and the free African Americans arrived and settled there. However, although black and white people attended school together and often lived near each other in Dresden, as was the case in um, other parts of Canada, there was intense discrimination toward the black community. For example, most business owners refused service to black people. Systemic racism was a significant barrier for black people um, in places like a, a, a Dresden. It was also a barrier for indigenous peoples and other communities of color across Canada. No pool room, restaurant, or even barber shop would serve black people. As such, from an early age, Burnett was, uh, Hugh Burnett was exposed to anti-black racism. One Sunday, when he was just about 16 years old, Burnett stopped his truck to help a white mot motorist who had run out of gas. Now, the man was so grateful that he insisted on taking Burnett for, for lunch. Although he already knew that he, would be, he could be refused service, Burnett thought that he might be accepted in the company of the white guy. He was, of course, wrong. But the experience stayed with him and he determined to do something to fight racism in his community, even after he moved out of a, a Dresden. Now, by 1943, after he had enlisted and been discharged from the army for medical reasons, while visiting Dresden, he went to a local restaurant wearing his army uniform. To his surprise, he was once again refused service in spite of his uniform. The incident led him to write to the Federal Minister of Justice, um, Louis Saint Laurent, informing him about the incident. To his disappointment, the Deputy Minister uh, uh, replied, he, the Deputy Minister replied and simply st stated that there was no law against racial discrimination in Canada. But rather than allow the incident to put him off, Burnett moved back to Dresden with his wife and children in 1948. There, he joined his uncles, um, William, Percy, and uh, Bernard Carter, who was spearheading a group to address racism in the town. They called the, the, the name of their group the National Unity Association, NUA. 
Vanek became the group's secretary, key organizer, and lead spokesman. Once in Dresden, he also established a successful carpentry business because there was a large enough black population uh, to kind of sustain his business. That same year, the NUA lobbied the Dresden Town Council to pass a bylaw against discrimination in local uh, businesses. After initially refusing, the council agreed to put the idea to a referendum the following year. And um, according to historian James Walker, it was the first and only time in Canadian history where racism was put to uh, a ballot. The efforts of uh, Bonnet and others in Dresden began to get widespread media attention. But unfortunately, the townspeople voted five to one against an anti-discrimination uh, bylaw. And um, however, in 1951, as a result of their campaign, alongside other civil rights organizations, the, the government of a premier, under a premier Leslie Frost, enacted the Fair Employment Practices Act, which forbade uh, discrimination in employment. However, this law did not address discriminatory practices in public service, which was one of the central issues uh, that the black people in Dresden were facing. By 1954, the NUA began working in earnest with the Toronto Joint Labor Committee for Human Rights to push for further anti-discriminatory legislation in Ontario. The Fair Accommodation Practices Act finally became law in June 1954. However, many business owners were not going to comply with the new law. Two local restaurants were particularly notorious for continuing to refuse service to black people. One was a case restaurant owned by Molly McKay, and the other was the Emerson's restaurant owned by Matthew and Ann Emerson. Burnett and the NUA then devised a tactic. They would go to these restaurants, take a seat, and ask for service. When they were refused, they lodged formal complaints through the Fair Accommodations Practices Act. These sit-ins were later adopted as a strategy by the American Civil Rights uh, Movement. In fact, Burnett's 1954 sit-ins took place in Ontario more than five years before they were prominent um, in, in the United States. Under public scrutiny, Dresden business owners began simply to close their shop whenever they saw NUA members uh, coming. This made it difficult for the NUA members to keep building its case. With the help of, the, uh, of, uh, of Sid Blum and the Toronto Joint uh, Labor Committee, the NUA then devised a new strategy. They began coordinating tests involving out-of-towners who were unfamiliar to uh, Dresden uh, business owners. So they brought people from uh, out of Dresden um, to go into uh, uh, shops where they were not known so that uh, the Dresden shop owners would not, be able, would not close their doors since they, they wouldn't recognize them as NU, as uh, people who were coming to sit in in their restaurants. Now, a reporter from Toronto um, might sometimes accompany and document the tests. This now allowed NUA to continue to gather evidence of discrimination thereby keeping the issue in the media uh, spotlight. One test case in late 1954 involving a black trade unionist and human rights activist, Bromley Armstrong, and uh, Ruth Law, 
a Chinese Canadian student resulted in high profile media coverage and uh, charges against case, uh, case cafe owner Molly McKay. While Mike McKay was ultimately found not guilty in this case, Burnett and others did not give up. And in November 1955, another test case proved more successful. Two Trinidadian University of Toronto students, Jake Allen and P.S.C. Bruce, were refused service at Case Cafe, and they then lodged complaints. In early 1956, McKay was once again charged. He was finally found guilty and forced to pay the required fines. The court case against McKay was a significant victory uh, for, for Burnett, the NUA, and uh, the, the civil rights and freedoms of black uh, communities uh, movements in, in Dresden and across uh, uh, Ontario. So on the 16th of November, 1956, members of NUA went to Case Cafe and for the first time ever, they were served. <laughs> They had no choice but to serve them. Hugh Burnett was a tireless force uh, for change, both in his community and in the fight for human rights uh, legislation in Ontario. Burnett's efforts with the NUA to bring attention to racial discrimination in Dresden held a mirror. They were able to succeed in holding up a mirror to Canadian society, and this forced public reckoning with uh, systemic racism in uh, Ontario and indeed Canada. Uh, he had was given several honors, uh, two numerous to mention, and in 2010, a plaque was erected in Dresden City by the Ontario Heritage Trust in honor of Hugh Bonnet's legacy. Thanks for watching. Please download your free copy of our children's books and support us through Patreon or by buying me coffee. Also, tell your friends about this channel.